Welcome to the Voices edition of the Ryersonian podcast. This is Jonathan Ferrani. And I'm Lauren Murphy. We break down some of the week's most interesting trending topics, including movie theater rebels, coffee made from poop, and Jesus. Keep it locked right here for that and much more. So now Lauren will break down the life topics of the week. Lauren, what do you have for us? Well, it's a bit of an interesting week, Jonathan. We've all heard the age-old hipster advice, put a bird on it. But a coffee grower in Brazil is taking that sage wisdom to a whole new, slightly disgusting level. The java grower is selling bags of beans extracted from the droppings of the Brazilian jacu bird. People are willing to pay over 3,000 bucks for a 60 kilo bag of this poop coffee, which is touted by the farmer as the most exquisite and high quality coffee available due to the jacu bird's advanced cocoa bag Berry selection skills. Wow. I don't think I can drink my coffee right now anymore. <laughs> it's nasty. It's it's also it's financially irresponsible and nasty. Let's be real. And you know, on to something a little more serious and, and less fecal related. A MFA, so a, a Masters of Fine Arts student at Yale started this photography project. It's called The City of Brotherly Love, which has been touted you know, as an alternative title, as, you know, picturing your harasser. So she created a bit of controversy with this project. Hannah Price, the photographer, who moved to Philadelphia from Colorado, decided to cope with, you know, the heavy onslaught of unwanted male attention or, you know, catcalling by reorienting the power dynamic of the experience by taking photos of her catcallers right after, you know, they whistle at her on the street. And, you know, many are calling this as a shutter foul, as the photos humanize the men, who they say blatantly dehumanize Price, while others are saying it gives her back some of her power. You know, my first reaction to catcalling isn't photography. Let me tell you, it's probably another hand gesture. So, power to her. She she clearly has something interesting going on here. So, Jonathan, uh, I've given you some coffee and some interesting catcalling responses. Tell me what's going on in arts. Well, this week in Problems America has that Canada doesn't, um, the Cannes Film Fest winner, Blue is the Warmest Color, is being released this week with the highest rating possible, the NC-17 rating. Um, That's usually a box office death sentence. Most filmmakers will tirelessly appeal the rating, which is given by the Motion Picture Association of America. Blue is the Warmest Color is about lesbian lovers, one of whom is a high school age student and features lengthy and explicit sex scenes. But one theater is ignoring the NC-17 rating. The IFC Center in New York City's Greenwich Village is standing out from the crowd of theaters that typically concede to the MPAA ratings. Though they don't have to, it's actually just a guide, not a law. The senior vice president and general manager of the IFC Center said, It is our judgment that it is not inappropriate for mature, inquiring teenagers who are looking ahead to the emotional challenges and opportunities that adulthood holds. They'll be admitting high school age patrons, actually. I haven't seen the movie yet, but New York Times critic A.O. Scott said that it may be best appreciated by viewers under the age of the NC-17 cutoff because of the high school character in the film. The MPAA system is a whole other story altogether that we could talk about, but just for some little perspective here, France is releasing the film with a 12 rating, which is basically the equivalent of PG-13. Montreal has the movie out with a 16 plus rating, and it's coming out in Toronto at the TIFF Bell Lightbox in a couple weeks with an R rating. So Greenwich Village is home to NYU also, which is of note. Um, So I'm pretty sure plenty of experimental first years will be heading to the movies this weekend. I just think it's funny because we're we're willing to show kids, you know, death, destruction, and what have you. But, you know, a little bit of, of sex, you know, we don't like it. Yep, it always scares the MPAA. It does. Yeah. Um, So it's been less than a week since the start of Kanye West's new tour, and he's already stirring lots of controversy. West has always been a controversial figure, of course, from his I'ma let you finish antics, (laughs) his so-called rants on Twitter and talk shows, and his baby naming, of course. He's always doing something interesting, it seems. Now, I'm not talking about the Vancouver concert cancellation, which has upset lots of our West Coast friends, 
And I'm not talking about the Jesus actor he has on stage during his show either. This time, it's his tour merchandise. Among the merchandise for sale are t-shirts and tote bags with Confederate flags on them. For the non-American history buffs, that's a reference to the flags of the slave states in the mid-1800s who seceded from the federal government before the Civil War broke out and slavery was eventually abolished. Now, the flags are pretty well accepted as historically racist symbols, so a lot of people in the states are really shocked by this. Um, Lauren, what do you think about, uh, about Kanye's merch? I just think it's an... It is, like you said, it's a historically accepted racist symbol. And while he may be trying to, to take back the meaning of of the flag, I think it's just something that we need to leave in the past and move on from. It, you know, what signifies a time when people were treated as property and, and very likely, you know, people that were potentially related to Kanye West were treated as chattel and, you know, beaten and enslaved. And I just think it's it's a little bit insensitive. I think that's a fair comment. Um, but I think the one thing that people often forget here is that Kanye West is an artist, whether you like it or not. Uh, you know, people don't often associate hip hop and rap with art. It is an accurate description to call him an artist. And the problem here, I think, is when people wear those shirts, they might not know what Kanye is trying to do. He is an artist, obviously coming out with a message. He's, you know, it's hard. you can't call Kanye West a racist based on if you've ever heard anything that he says. He has a lot of very um, well-spoken opinions about race and, and culture. But the problem is, who is going to be wearing those shirts? Who's going to be slinging those tote bags over their shoulders? And what message are they going to be presenting when they show those images to people? I just think that we have to ask the question of what if it would take Kanye West and how he is, he always is, you know, pushing the envelope, right? It's kind of what he does. But if it wasn't him, if it was another artist, would we, we be as willing to accept, oh, this is art? You know, say it was like a country western singer. We'd be like, no, what, that's racism. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just think some of these symbols are better left to their very, you know, sullied past. It'll be interesting to see what he has to say. Well, you know, he needs the money because he'll be planning a wedding very soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with his engagement to Kim. Very true. Yeah, so, you know, regardless of what we think, I think they'll sell well. People were so upset he canceled the, the Vancouver event, mm -hmm. or Vancouver concert. So I guess it just sort of remains to be seen. That's all for this week's Voices podcast. Join us next Thursday for some more art, life, class, and sass. I'm Lauren Murphy. And I'm Jonathan Ferrani.